welcome welcome to everybody as usual i say i don't mind you um chiming in saying amen if you have a question you can either unmute yourself and ask the question or you can raise um the question in the chat um we thank everyone for coming on i can see brother heron calling out that sister boucher is from the uk but now in saint vincent i think you made a good choice sister boucher um i too left the uk a little while ago um still my home i consider it but thank god for everyone uh, being on tonight we were on the subject of escaping the mark of the beast and we were taking the approach of searching the scriptures and once more we're gonna just go into this study um, I know in the last session, it might seem like we veered a little bit um, to the right or the left when we started to look at family. Um, but to, to be honest, it's, it's really a part of the study. The way we uh, raise our families in this day and time needs to look like what the church should look like. Amen. Our church in the end time really should be a picture of what the world needs to be. And so it's, it's not good enough that we have equal or worse divorce rates than the world. It's not good. Um, we, we, we must have better family structure. We must have um, better homes. Um, we should have more grace. We should have more peace. The church is the apex. We are the height of God's achievement in the earth. And so Jesus recognized that men look on the outward. I know sometimes we use this phrase in a, um, in a, in a fleshly way to say that, you know, but God looks at the heart. But let's, let's consider this, that men look at the outward. That is what men see first. And so the church must still have a good outward show. Jesus put it this way. He says, therefore, let your light so shine. Not in a bushel, not in your church, not in a place where nobody can see, but let it shine before men. And so the, the teaching and why we come together in the midweek, even when we were in church, I think pastors all over the world have been trying to stress to people the reason why we need you in midweek Bible study is because this is the time where we disciple you. This is the time where we really get to dress the church and, and prepare the church to really meet Christ, to prepare the church to really be the bride. A um, question was asked by John in Revelation. He says, well, who, who, who are these people? Who is this great crowd? Who is this great multitude? And he says a few things. These were they that came to great tribulation. But he says they also washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And we have to help believers to understand that your life on earth is about washing and cleansing. It's about making sure that we are ready to meet Christ. It's, he's coming for a bride. He said that he's without spot and without wrinkle or any such thing. And, and, and we're in a generation that likes to believe that grace will deal with the spots and grace will deal with the wrinkles. But the Bible says that these folks, they wash their own robes and they made them white in the blood of the lamb. Um, I don't know if any of us have had lazy children, but lazy children don't necessarily want to do their own washing. And, and, and unfortunately in the church system today, we have people who are hoping that somebody else would do their laundry for them. Um, you have to wash your own clothes. You have to, um, live a life that's clean. The Bible says in Revelation that the, the white linen is the righteousness of saints. And so part of this study tonight is really to, to make sure that the church is focusing on living right and being right with God. Um, not fearing so much any electronic chip or not fearing so much the government systems. What the, what the enemy is going to do is going to do. Um, the changes that are going to happen in the world are going to happen. But what's more important it's not that just we, we are protesting against systems, but that we are actually living a good Christian life. Uh, Paul said, I, I can give my body to be burned, but if I don't have love, then I'm just a sounding glass and a simple symbol. So we don't want to be believers that know how to make noise, um, but don't know how to love right, don't know how to live right. So that's, that's the spirit of the study, to really escape the mark of the beast we've been looking at is really to take the character of Christ on and to, to grow and develop in the nature of Christ. Peter calls it divine nature. He says, you know, by these, by, by these promises, we have become partakers of divine nature. Amen. So Amen. we're not talking about human nature. Uh, we are living to suppress and defeat human nature and to exalt divine nature. And so when people like to tell you um, that's just the way I am or I'm only human, we can't let that conversation stop there because you're not called to be only human. 
you're called to be a partaker of divine nature. And that doesn't happen um, just by listening to gospel music. It doesn't happen even just by visiting church. It comes by Amen. spending time in the presence of God. It comes by spending time looking into the perfect law of liberty. The thing that you look at is the thing that you um, become. Uh, we, we are translated from glory to glory, looking into the mirror of God's word. So where our focus is, is, is what we, we become more like. Um, I used to say to my young people, if you come into church looking like Beyonce, then I know, I know what you've been looking at. Um, if you come in here trying to sing like somebody from the world, then I know what you've been listening to. Uh, we become like the things that we spend time with and all that in this time that we would spend more time with Christ. And so um, I'm seeing comments coming in. Let me just check and make sure. All right. We're getting just some amens and I don't mind if you want to shout them, it's fine. Uh, welcome to those who are still coming in. I'm not going to recap the whole lesson. I've done that twice. And what I am going to do is go back to Solomon and um, we're going to start from Solomon again because we've got number three on this to, to look at. And actually, I've, I'm, I've added a bit more to part two because I, I, I felt what God was doing in last week's session around family. So I'm going to go back to treatment of children for a little while. And then I'm going to go on to treatment of human life. Now, to explain for those who are coming on for the first time, we looked at Solomon's downfall and we were just drawing some dotted lines from what happened in uh, 1 Kings 10, uh, from verse 14 to 15, it began to say there that, you know, annually Solomon started to get um, 666 talents of weight in gold annually. So every year that was his income. And it's the first place in the Bible we see the numbers 666 six, six, um, together. And so uh, we we could ignore it and say that's just chance. I decided I want to dig and see what happened after Solomon's life was structured in this way and he was getting 666 talents of weight and gold annually. What comes after we find out is that he begins to be susceptible to foreign women. And it was a specific command that the Lord told the children of Israel. And he was warned that you shouldn't marry um, these strange women from other nations. Um, it was said that they would turn your heart away from the Lord. And um, this, is, this is important because um, the enemy never entices people with hell. Hell is not attractive. Right? The devil is never holding up a sign saying, follow me, I want to take you to hell. Um, he first is trying to make you fall in love with something that will lead you astray. Okay, that's his, his trick. He's never showing you the reward. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Um, but the Bible also speaks about sin as being pleasurable. Um, the psalmist said that he, he, he would rather um, dwell in the house of the Lord than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So Christians who try to say that sin isn't pleasurable. Uh, well, they're lying to you. Sin is pleasurable, but sin has worked. Right? So that always enticing this brother here. He seems to have a super unmuting powers. Here we go. Um, sin is always showing you the good side. Um, they have an old saying that everything that glistens is gold. Um, and the enemy is always going to try and show you something very attractive. Solomon, he fell in love with women. And each of these women seemed to lead him into some worship of some other god. And the sum of the study me that the things that he became exposed to um, are the same spirits that are prevalent in this time. And so uh, we looked at the treatment of women. We looked at how uh, women and, how, and, and sex has been the downfall of so many people, so many preachers, so many leaders. It's been a shame to see um, the things that have happened in the past, things that are coming to light, even over the last 10 years, the preachers that have had to leave the pulpit, preachers that have gone to prison. Um, worse than this are the stories that have not yet been told of um, women that have been abused and children that have been abused. And so we looked at how the spirit of lust 
uh, in this time is really attacking uh, people and the men of God in particular, trying to seduce men away. Then we looked at um, Moloch and the treatment of children. And last week we, um, we talked about how they were passing children through the fire. And we looked a little bit about how in our own life, we can do this as Christian people. How do we sacrifice our children? And I will summarize some of this, but I've got more to touch on tonight. We talked about the things we expose our children to most um, and that bringing our children to church is not enough, that there needs to be church in the home. Not only that, but there needs to be a good structure for children in the house. You know, um, and I, I didn't say this last week, but me and my wife got to a point where we, we had to sit back and say, something's not working here. Um, sometimes as parents, we can live our lives where our children are constantly running behind us. And the activities that we do, they are parent-centered activities, which children just have to be a part of because that's what we need to do. And one of the things that we decided we needed to do is that we needed to try and break up the time that we spend with our children so that they're not constantly chasing us, right? That we are actually having some child-focused, child-centered um, activities that are deliberately for them. So it comes down to the way we do devotion at home. We, we don't want to do devotion at a high level that doesn't relate to them. We want them to get it, so we, we, we break it down for them. We ask them, do you understand? And what do you understand by this? Tell us what you think. What does this make you feel? And in doing that, we're not only building relationship, but we are cementing their spirit to the word of God. And so let's, let's think about that, that um, our children don't just chase us to church. Even sometimes church um, has not always been child-centered, and we, we hope that they get something in the midst of what's happening to us. So hopefully we have really engaging Sunday school teachers who bring the word of God down to their level and so on. We talked about we, what are we teaching them by the way we live in front of them. So without any words, what are we telling them about how to treat a woman, how to treat a man, how to be a husband, how to be a father or, or how to be a wife? What are we actually teaching them in our behavior about how we treat elderly people, about how we take care of the poor? You know, some things, yes, sometimes we do in private. The Bible says, you know, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing sometimes. And that's, you know, when we're sometimes doing our good deeds. But it is necessary that your children are exposed to your kindness, that they are seeing you be kind to people. They're seeing you support folks who are, who are lonely, visiting people, you know, bring them into a phone call. If you're calling up some of the elderly to say hello, teach them the same level of respect. We talked about training up the child the way they should go and being very deliberate about training. Don't sus suspect that they're just going to get it because they're in the same house as you. I was also raised in a pastor's house and I was, I was exposed to a whole lot of good things and I did learn a lot, but there's also a whole lot we're not paying attention to as children. And so it's good for us to be deliberate about how we teach our children. One of the other points was not, not seeking to fulfill our purposes in our children's life, but really seeking God for their purpose. Um, we talked about the fact that as parents, we, we all want our children to do good, but part of us wanting them to do good is because it reflects good on us. Um, we want to be able to say, my, you know, my son is this, he's a doctor, he's a lawyer, um, he's very successful, he's this, he's married. You know, we love to brag about our children in the flesh. That's just how we are as parents. We want our children to be the head and not the tail, even if that means that somebody else's child is the tail. We are intrinsically selfish in that way. And so we say we have to really taper this back and be Christ-like and make sure that we are uncovering God's purpose for each of our children. <clears throat> okay, so summarizing that, we said selfish parenting leads to the sacrifice of your children. We, we broke that down. So if you want to see <clears throat> this teaching in detail, then um, we can share that link to you. Um, but tonight I want to step forward, <clears throat> sorry, and look more at um, children and legacy. So I think I'm showing a bit more than I want to at one time. I want to speak to us as parents now about, again, the, the doors that we leave open. And I'm speaking very much from Again, experience, as I said, four children, 17 years married. And um, if you're in the spirit, you can, you can pick up different things over time about your children, about what's happening in their life. Um, so I've put here, sometimes we can leave doors open. When we don't resolve conflict, <clears throat> we leave doors open. What do I mean by that? 
there are, there are spirits that can only access your life and only access your house if you leave a door open. Now, if, if we're praying people, we understand um, that sometimes in the spirit, we have to really shut some things down. We have to search ourselves and say, God, I, you, know, you know, you're going to the throne of grace, but the Lord is showing you there's a sister or a brother that you need to go and say sorry to. You're trying to get a breakthrough. You wonder why you can't get a breakthrough because you were rude. I remember as a child, as being saved as a, as a teenager, being um, cheeky sometimes. And my Lord, the Lord would have to tell me, you need to go back and apologize. Um, I remember even trying to pray and my room was messy. And the Lord would say, tidy up the room. <laughs> All right. When you're in relationship with God, he gives you clues as to open doors. But sometimes, you know, and the Bible says this for husband and wife, especially, we shouldn't let the sun go down on our rock. Uh, we shouldn't go to bed with arguments that have not been resolved. We've been advised by the scriptures to do that. I want to tell you an experience that I have and, and why this is very important. Because when you don't resolve conflict, I saw this happen. I saw my, my children getting night terrors yeah, on the nights where my conflict was not resolved with my wife. They would have nightmares. I would hear my children scream out. And I was able to connect the two things together. Spirit should not have access to my house so easy. All right? I mustn't be leaving doors open for them. Um, certain things that we engage in, conversations, if we're bringing certain music in the house, not godly music, you, you're opening another spiritual door. You, you're watching movies that have got things in them that are not savory to the eye. You are opening the doors for spirits to come into sure. Yeah. So... The psalmist put it this way. He says, I, I will not set no wicked thing before mine eye. And Amen. Really careful about the things that we are just comfortable with watching. And for those who've been on for a few weeks, you know my stance on this, whether it's the, the films we're watching, um, you know, the, 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 the shows that, that, it, that bring in homosexuality, um, we have to really stamp them out and say, no, this is not, this is not right. I'm always told my saints back home, don't, don't go to bed with the TV on. Yeah. It's better you go to bed with some Christian music playing, but don't fall asleep in front of no TV because those things carry spirits and you might think it's simple, but people can get delivered through. I see people get delivered through television, through hearing a word. People don't right. recognize that you know, words are spirit. Yes. Words are spoken, spirits are released. Okay, so we, we can't afford to really go down at nighttime with, with worldly things playing in the house. Um, with, with arguments not resolved, we have to realize we are putting our children at risk when we do this. Um, when we don't overcome personal private battles, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this and, and looking at Jehu, but um, this is another thing I've learned. It goes for the pulpit and it goes for us as, as fathers. It's so important that we continue to win the personal fight. I think every individual knows what they still have yet to achieve. You might have ongoing battles and you know that I've won this battle, but I'm still having this battle. Um, I've got discipline in this area, but I still need more discipline in this area. I believe any believer who's really seeking after God will constantly be looking to, to close the gaps in the areas of their life where they know, whether it's you need more time in prayer, um, whether it's you need to spend more time in the word. Yes, sir. You need to spend more time in worship. We all know the areas where we could excel some more and where we could, right? Pray, right? We, we know we feel better when we leave the house having prayed. We know we do. We know we feel better when we've left the house having read a word in the morning. But we do have days where we either get up late or we stay up late the night before and we miss devotion. We know. We know when, when we fall short. And it's not that God is um, holding it against us and it's not like we treat this as works. This is just like getting breakfast in the morning, you understand? Um, right. Our prayer is not works. It's just, and, and, the, and reading the word is not works. It's making sure you're fed. It's making sure you're, you're watered and it's making sure you're clean. Right. Amen. Amen. People like, people like to tell me that fasting is just works and God's not looking at your works. I tell them to go away because you don't understand. Fasting is like taking a, a wash. It's like going for a shower and a bath. Yeah. You don't, you don't call it works to take a bath. You're just making sure you don't smell. <laughs> Right. right. So, so we do all of these things to keep ourselves spiritually clean 
and pure. And so sometimes we have given up on certain matters in our life. We've given up on certain issues. We've given up on winning certain fights and we need to go back to that place and make sure we get victory. One of the reasons I found is that because usually there's a spirit behind the thing that you can't beat. And the spirit of the thing that you can't beat will linger in your life and it will also linger in your house. And the things that you don't defeat will not only affect you, but it will affect your children. Where you have weaknesses, you are likely to reproduce weaknesses in the people that you lead. You can't really take people to places you haven't gone. Right? This is why the man of God must be sober. When it speaks about, um, when, when, when Paul is speaking about the kind of man that should be a deacon and the kind of man that should be a bishop, right? He's, 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 he's taking this very seriously because when you are in charge of leading people, you can't have a whole host of things you haven't defeated. Your leader is there to help to lead you into victory in places where you don't have victory yet. <laughs> right. So if you have a leader who's still losing in areas where you need victory, you're in trouble. Because he can't pray you through, he can't preach you out, which is why <laughs> so many churches have got dysfunctional families because the pastor at the top, he still ain't talking to his wife properly. He still ain't treating his children right. And so how are you going to produce people that understand that and get that correct when you don't have the counsel for it and you don't have the medicine for it? Um, the word I've got to put it this way is that you know, we must be first partaker of the fruits right as the workman we must be worthy of the word as teachers paul said that we are being held to account more than anybody else because we're here teaching this thing so it's important that we strive to have victories um listen men that don't overcome pornography you are you're you're holding a, a very lustful spirit in your house and your child can't beat that spirit it's too strong for them Parents who are deceiving, never, never telling the truth, never, never, never speaking the whole truth. Come on, man. Well, sometimes we have to, we have to get, get clean. You know, where were you after work? Well, I was just making my way home. There was a bit of traffic, but you know, you stop somewhere. <laughs> you know, you, you practice deception. And what you don't realize is that you are cultivating a spirit in your house that is going to get into your children. I don't want to say amen to that. But go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Amen. 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 We don't beat are going to end up attacking our children. Yeah. I've also put here the doors we leave, leave open when we don't repent. Mm. And church, this, I believe this is the hour of repentance for the church. I, I believe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we don't get anything else out of this, this window of time, let us get repentance from this. This is the time for us to really make amends. I've heard so many good testimonies so far of families reuniting in this time. I'm mm -hmm. so grateful to hear those testimonies. Um, people that weren't talking are now talking. This is the mm -hmm. time for mm -hmm. us to put our, our differences behind and mend those broken relationships, even if we weren't the person that did the wrong. This is the time to go back and, and try again. I talk about you know, battles that we, we gave up on relationships we gave up on um some testimonies are maybe even just just too personal to give them but i want to encourage you sometimes relationships break down between mother and father between son and between daughter and sometimes we wash our hands of family and we let go of them and say i'm done with them i'm not i'm not no more time for them this is the time to try again this is the time to make amends this is the time to reach out because i think the church had we moved away from Matthew 5. Um, I don't know where we got lost, somewhere between Romans and Revelation. But the simplicity. season, brother, Matthew 5. Yes, the simplicity of loving your neighbor, the simplicity of, of being humble, the simplicity of serving others, the simplicity of, of making things right, of having forgiveness in your heart, of going the extra mile, of turning the other cheek. Amen we became such professional Christians that people didn't have to say sorry anymore. People don't have to apologize no more. Mm -hmm. They make mistakes or, you know, or they, or they, they do things that are wrong and they, and they don't repent of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, leaders got away with so much in the name of God said, 
and I'm the leader and you must do. It's just so much things that we need to repent of in this season. Can't Amen. get away with it again. It's time for us to really check ourselves, find the folks that, um, that we fell out of good favors with. The people that we just decided we're not dealing with them anymore. This, this is not the spirit of the church. The church was meant to be the most loving place on the earth. Yeah. The Lord said this is, this is, if they didn't, they would know that you're my disciples, not by how much of the word you have, not by how much miracles you did. Amen. Yeah? We love, we love. The way you love would be the defining fact. They, they would not be able to find love like this anywhere else in the world. The church is the best place on earth. I still believe it. I still believe it. I was saying to my wife this week, I am so happy to be a part of the family of God. Amen. Listen, when you, when you are helping others and serving others, God will find a way to serve you and to bless you. Amen. Yeah. You, 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 you will give to the left and you'll receive from the right. Amen. That's how good God is. I love the people of God. People of God are thoughtful. Amen. They think about you. They think about, you know what? I'm gonna bring you. I'm gonna bring you some food. Someone did this for us this Sunday. That's why I guess I'm still, I'm still um, enjoying the taste of the fish escovich. <laughs> uh, someone made me some good dinner on Sunday and said, you know what? You don't have to cook this Sunday. I said, thank you, Jesus. I love the church. They didn't know that me and my wife was feeding other people over there, but that's the church. That is the church. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but the church. And the world Amen. must look at us and know that, boy, these people, they love each other. We right. got caught up in the last 20 years of people saying, my pastor Amen. must drive a Mercedes. My pastor must live in a mansion. All that foolishness that Jesus never said. And so <laughs> now all of a sudden people made the mark of a Christian prosperity when actually the mark of the believer is love. <laughs> Amen. Right. Amen. So we, we in this season want to get back the love of God. I, I pray Amen. that all over we, we give the biggest hugs that we ever could have given. Amen. We, Amen. We've had to be socially distanced for so long. You know, for, for a long time, we've been telling folks when you come into this service, it could be your last one. Worship God like never before. And people just take it for a saying. But my God, <laughs> it could have been your last time. So we want to make sure that the love of God is felt. And so repentance is a sign that the love of God is really there. Um, to the Ladosian church, mm -hmm. uh, the Lord said, be zealous to repent, be quick. I, I believe in the dispensational teaching. I know some people don't, but I believe that the Ladosian church represents the last church age, the age where we're rich and increased with goods. And we think we have need of nothing. We, we think we have everything, but the Lord sees us as poor, wretched, and blind. Mm -hmm. um, this is that time where nobody's really hot for God anymore. We're lukewarm and God's about ready to spit us out. It's the time where he's standing at the door trying to get in the church. Mm -hmm. It's that time, no, I feel exactly. we're in that time right now. Um, but he says to them that, you know, you should, you should be quick to repent. Don't, don't take a long time to, to repent. You, you fall out with somebody today, make, try and fix it the same day. Don't, don't Amen. wait tomorrow is not promised okay so when we don't repent we, we leave doors open we end up teaching our children bitterness one of the things that many christian children is how much church folks talked about church in front of their ch unsaved children so many backsliders and people who would never come to church it was christian people gossiping about other believers that put some of our children off of being saved we made them despise church we made them despise church people because we brought too much news from church home we needed more discipline certain certain stories should have never reached the ears of our children because you know what bad things happen in church you know why because bad things happen in the world and that's where we get our people from yeah you know my father would always say people say there's too much hypocrites in church and my dad would say yes and we have we have room for more <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Church is the place where hypocrites must be able to get their ways put straight, mm -hmm. where we must learn honesty. You know what hypocrisy mm -hmm. is? It, it comes from acting. It was a, a Greek uh, dramatic play where you'd have one character who would come on in one scene with a mask on his face and he'd come in the next scene with the mask off, but it's the same person. And church has become very much like that. People 
come in church with the mask and they want to show you a good face, you know, but they don't want to really expose what's really going on in their life. They want to just make you think that they're okay. But I thank God for church that we can be open, we can be honest, we can give a testimony to church. I need you to pray for me tonight. I'm going through this, please help me. Uh, sometimes testimony just turn into, you know, the, the, the testimonies that make us look good. <laughs> you know, I was on the road today and I was preaching to my friend. Okay, great. What about the day when you did cuss out the man and you had to go and repent and say sorry? See, we don't, we don't tell the stories that put us in a bad light, right? Yet some of those stories would have helped somebody to know that, you know what? He failed, but God helped him. He failed, but God picked him up. Amen. True, sir. Church is stage. <laughs> my, my baby has just breached my room. I don't know how she got in. Daddy, Papa just come. Okay, tell him hello for me, okay? He's gone. Okay, thank you. He come coming back. All right. Bye-bye. All right, she's three. Forgive. All right, sir. So let's, let's be repentant. Let's really be, be ready to repent. Let's be zealous to repent. Um, there were some comments there. Let me just see if, if it's more than amen. All right. So Brother Heron has posted a scripture. Oh, hand is up. Sister Olive, your hand is up. We'll take that first and then we'll, we'll read the scripture. Praise the Lord, Mr. Joseph. I was just um, going to comment on something you said in regards to falling asleep with the TV on. Mm -hmm. I was just going to tell of my experience and say that is so true. I've had a, an experience that change my uh, view on sleeping falling asleep with the tv on i don't do it anymore mm -hmm. one night i was watching a documentary on marriages and it, it went through marriages um from every aspect in the church in the world and uh, the last um, marriage that they talked about um was um gay marriage and i remember after watching the documentary i fell asleep and while I was asleep, I felt like something came through the TV and grabbed me. Yeah. And I remember this, it was so real. Like I felt the thing grab my hand and was pulling me. And it's like pulling me and I'm like, no, no, no. That is not my belief. I don't believe that. And you know, I was just pleading the blood and just pulling it off. I remember that was the, the year I got baptized. And that thing just kept pulling me through and pulling me through and it was like a fight. It was such a, a fight because I just felt that force just pulling me through the TV. And from that day until now, I don't sleep with the TV in my room. I remove the TV out of my room completely. Mm -hmm. And I try to do my very best not to fall asleep in front of a TV because that left such an impression on me. Yes. It was so real and it was so, I felt the demonic force just pulling me. And I knew it was the homosexual spirit that was just pulling and trying to get me to, you know, I don't know what it is, the way of thinking or just the way of life, but it was a fight to just fight off that force. So I can attest to that to say, falling asleep in front of the TV is not, not a good um, practice or even to have it in your bedroom. I don't even have a TV in my bedroom anymore. I just completely remove it from that experience. So I'm just confirming to tell you, say what you have said in that regards is absolutely true. I, I appreciate the testimony. Um, and, and, and this is how spirits work, right? Um, I keep promising to teach on this a little while, um, but how spirits try to proposition you in your sleep. They try to bring you over to their side they try to compromise your viewpoints, get you to laugh at something, get you to agree with something. The enemy is very, very subtle. I too don't have a television in my room. That's, that's my choice because for me, that's not what my room is for. I need to have a space where it's for me, my wife and God. I don't want anything like TV in my bedroom. And some people, can, some people are fine with it. I mean, you have to know yourself. I'm a person that used to be, go from one channel to the next. I, I, I take it completely out of my way. If you know you have a weakness for something, then you leave that thing alone, um, put it far from you, and give yourself the advantage by not making yourself have to, to uh, walk past it every day. So as you, as you grow as a believer, you sometimes have to take certain steps to make sure that you can retain victory in your life. Uh, Brother Heron posted the scripture from... Yeah, Pastor. Yes, sir. 
don't really know. I read probably after you, you, you speak on the scripture, I, I'd want to, to make a comment oh, yeah, on give it, give some it. things that you I, previously I will, said. I will call Brother Heron to just give his thought on the scripture. All right. So, right. So, uh, I, um, as you, you had already, you earlier raised in terms of, you know, probably I'm paraphrasing now, in terms of that lack of honesty on our part sometimes, where many times we try to present the perfect image before our brethren mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and give this sort of a pretense as if, you know, we have never erred, you know. Mm -hmm. but I want to share an experience and um, I had reason to be ministering to some young converts and I, and I had to share it with them just to let them know that in this walk, you are going to have those moments. Um, I remember one evening I was home and um, there were two strange looking men over by a house across from where I live. And um, I, I went over to them and I dealt with them very rough. You know, as a, as a police officer, I dealt with them very rough. And, uh, you know, I actually arrested them took them to check out where they were from and so on. And um, in the process, I, I, I had to rough up my neighbor who they actually went to also. And uh, after I finished dealing with them, you know, the Lord spoke to me. It's like I felt horrible. And the Lord spoke to me and said to me that um, I need to go and apologize to them. And, um, and so, you know, it was like a, a battle there. and then. The Lord was just pressing upon me that I need to find these guys and I need to apologize to them. And uh, it's like I was dragging my feet and then the Lord allowed me to have a vision and showed, showed me in the vision these same guys coming over by my house with their big guns and they were like saying, let me see what your gun can do now. And um, a few <coughs> days after I was on my way from work, with my daughter, I think in the vehicle. And I saw one of the guys and I just stopped. I said, well, I said to myself, I'm not going to allow this opportunity to pass. You know, the flesh has got to be subdued. And I stopped and I said, good evening, sir. Um, I said, I just stopped by to tell you that, you know, I want to apologize and tell you that I'm truly sorry for the way I conducted myself, the way I dealt with you. Um, I believe that um, I could have dealt with the situation in a much better way. And um, I inquired of him, you know, where his friend was. And he said that he wasn't there at the time. And I said to him, you can convey to your friend my message. And if I see him, I will tell him personally. And it's like when I did that, it's almost like you could see, like, this wall was torn down. Wow. And the guy stuck out his hand and shook my hand because he had never expected it. But the Lord wasn't true with me, you know. So after I did that, and I said, well, Satan, you lose again. Then the Lord said to me, no, you need to go and apologize to your neighbor. That was the hardest part for me. There's just two, two females, and the Lord keep nagging me, you need to apologize to your neighbor. So you know what the Lord did? One morning, probably about 6 o'clock, as soon as I stepped outside, opened the grill to go to the car, there were the two ladies, mother and daughter, standing right across the road. It's like the Lord had them lined up waiting on me. And I just said to myself, pride, you're going through the door, flesh, you're going through the door. And I stepped across to them and I said, good morning. They were a bit apprehensive because they didn't know what I was going to do or say. And I said, you know, I just want to tell you that I'm truly sorry, you know, for my conduct, for my behavior, um, you know, the other night. And I promise you, it will never happen again. And I remember during the interaction, the mother was very very, very aggressive and behaving badly. And immediately she, when I apologized, she apologized to me too. And she said, Miss I really know it's just the devil, you know. And it's like it just teared down a wall again, right? So I'm just say it and you lose again. Yeah, man. So, and this, and as you rightly said, this is the level of honesty we need to have because somebody may be faced with the same challenge and they may feel like, why I did something so bad that it's probably unforgivable. But, but if they hear this testimony, they say, oh, I need to go and make it right. Because truly, if, you're, if these things are unresolved, as I, say, as I say, unresolved, left unresolved, the open doors that you will regret. You'll regret. Your prayers will be blocked. Yeah. 
Because the Lord now go here here until you make things right and do it even according as he wants us to do it. So it's so true. And, and that's the part that scares me, right? Because I wonder how some, some of us hold on to some stuff for so long. It's telling me that we're okay not being in relationship with Christ because you can't tell me that you're having sweet fellowship with God with unresolved conflict. So, so then this, this means that church has become such a religion for some of us that we are somehow maintained and happy to not be in full relationship with Christ, yet in church. It worries me. It worries me. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to say people are not saved, but I, I can only talk from my experience of, and, and what Brother Rowan was saying. I bear witness that this is true. Like if, if God has asked you to do something to solve a problem, you don't do it, then you, you, you lose your fellowship, right? Prayer become ritualistic. Reading become ritualistic. Church become ritualistic. So I, let, you, let us really examine ourselves. There's, a, there's a, an old song I like. It's a questioning song. It says, how long has it been since you talked with the Lord? How long since you um, knelt by your bed? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed till the light shone through? I mean, how long has it been till you cried in prayer? You understand what I'm saying? How long has it been since we've, we know that we are actually working with God in prayer? I'm not just calling upon him, right? The Bible says, in Paul says that we are workers together with him. You know? We're not in the stage anymore. For those of us who are saved, we're not in the stage anymore of just um, wanting salvation. We have salvation now. Now we must become workers together with Christ. And so may we be very certain that we have made our calling and election sure, that we're not just in a religious cycle of I go to church, I have, I have friends, I have brethren, I do good, I give to charity. Let's, let's make sure we have a, a living, breathing relationship with God. Right, if, sir. If I love Amen. you, I'm chasing you. If, if you're my son, then I will chase you. The one that doesn't get chasing in, I have, I am, I'm worried for you. That right. God has given up on correcting you because you've been stubborn so long. Let that not be us tonight. Brother Heron, you've been posting, man. Give us some of your thoughts. I know you've been dropping some word here in the chat. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just humbled and I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing uh, because, you know, as to my calling, you know, I know surely what, you know, purpose the Lord, uh, you know, has called me unto and, you know, I strive daily and, um, humbly to, you know, please the Lord in whatsoever I do. You know, I recall um, a bishop once, um, and I think you, you know him also, Bishop Mackenzie, um, while I had the opportunity, to, the opportunity to fellowship with him at one of uh, their assembly hearings in Vincent and the Grenadines, and I recall him always sharing um, his experience with um, the, the television. He said that, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have a TV in his house because there was a time when the TV was in his house and he somewhat came in and he heard the TV cursing him. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he said from that time, he told his wife, He's not living with any TV in his house or anything in his house cursing him. So, you know, he, he and his wife both come to an agreement that not anything in the house that will curse them. <laughs> so, you know, I, I always remember he, he always sharing this, why he doesn't have a TV, because he's not living in any house with anything cursing him that he purchased. And, um, you know, I, I, I relate, you know, along the same line, you know, I'm not one. Well, you know, since I've grown much mature, I see where I don't have any inclination. I don't have a TV. My wife is not someone also, thanks be to God, who has such inclination um, for TV. Um, not long ago, I suffered a, a break-in into my house. Um, and 
you know, God is so good, brethren, because, you know, when I was away for about 30 days to 21 days, you know, um, the house was never been broken into. But as soon as I returned, <laughs> the house was broken into. <laughs> and, you know, I... I, I, you know, I was, you know, in awe. I was like, Lord, you know, when I was away for all this time, the house wasn't broken into. But now I returned, the house was broken into. And um, my neighbor's house was broken into. And I heard they took two of those flat t um, flat screen TV. Uh, they broke into my house. My house had many items, newly bought, purchased items. But I had no TV. I had no radio. And apparently, you know, they only took a, a toolkit for me. But all the other items, somewhat, it seemed like the Lord blinded their eyes. Um, only a few items they went away with, which was, you know, no loss to me, you know. And so, you know, I say to us, even as you said, you know, um, if we're going to come to a higher place and come to greater experience and fellowship with God, then we must purpose in our heart. It's not, it's not just going to happen like magic are, you know, out of tin air. There has to be a consciousness in us wherein that we believe the word of God and apply it in our daily life. So even as David said, I will put no wicked thing before my eyes. Someone need to look into those verses and take them up within their own life and within their own space and begin to practice it. And by us practicing the word where if we know that we're oftentimes given over to you know, um, hide the nest and, you know, um, giving our eyes to things that are unprofitable, um, then surely there comes a time if we're going to go higher and, 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 and to allow Christ to be seen or manifest in us, then there has to be a sacrifice on our part wherein that we lay aside the things that the Lord would have admonished us through his servants before us that, you know, except we put aside these things and become solely sold out to the Lord in obeying his word, that fellowship, you know, you speak about love, you know, one scripture that do always govern my, that governs, governs my life, you know, before the Lord. And it is the fundamental, right back at the beginning, I think Deuteronomy chapter six and verse four, um, when the Lord said, thou shalt love Amen. the Lord thy God oh. with all thy heart, with I that that verse don't leave my heart, neither my spirit, because mm -hmm. I recognize that the primary thing that the Lord wants of his children and of his creatures that he made is for them to love him with all. And sometimes I say, Lord, I don't know, you know, if if I am even even close to giving you a quarter, much less all. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him to help me time and time again because it's my desire to come closer mm -hmm. to the Lord in that fellowship. So, you know, um, true words that, you know, the time we have gotten in this season where we are given rest, because I consider it rest mm -hmm. given unto the nations of the earth and unto God's children in this time, um, rest mm -hmm. wherein that we can work and build on our most holy faith in Christ Jesus. And so, I want to encourage the brethren for, for sure that, you know, let it not just be talk, but we must put the word of God into action for us to begin to experience the things that God has in store for us. It's not going to happen by wishful thinking either. It has to be mm -hmm. literal sacrifice, literal uh, consciousness as Daniel Lem in the book, you know, um, of Daniel where the Bible says, and Daniel purpose in his heart this was a consciousness. He was purposing his heart that he won't eat the king's meat. How many of us of late would have been purposing our heart that we're going to put away the phone for the entire week and don't press a button and just, you know, shut in with the Lord when we come from our work and just put away the phone and spend some alone time without any of the living things and spend some time in the unliving bread and let the Lord Amen. work upon our hearts. You know, how many of us have been purposing our heart about something? Because these, these were given for examples that we have to purpose in our hearts about some things that we know are our 
shortcomings. We know our, our weaknesses, but seem as if we just read the word and, you know, take it as just, you know, fables. But for me, I believe it, that we have to practice it. Amen. Amen, Amen sir. Amen. And I, I am a Amen, brother. Amen. firm believer in, in this very, very practical approach. And um, let, it, let it be something that we take with us, as, especially the, as, as men on here. Um, I see all the men as, as leaders, we're all pastors in our houses. And um, we, we have to really continue to ask the right questions of each other as men as well. You know, if I was to ask you, when is the next fasting for your house? I wonder if you have a date. You know, when's the next time of fasting for you and your children? You know, like this is a time now where I realize I can do that with them more because of them being at home all the time. And um, I determined that in this window, I must take them. So my children, one of them is 13. She's, she's baptized. The other one is nine and, and, and seven and both want to be saved. I say, God, I, I, want, I want these two boys to be filled before I baptize them. That's, that's my prayer. Uh, I, I'm trying to groom them to really seek the Lord and find him. I, I, don't, I don't need them in church to be saved. That's my job to help them to get there. And we had them on fasting a few weeks ago and um, woke them up early. And um, I said, I don't even mind if they fall asleep in the prayer, as long as they're in the prayer. And um, one of my youngest boys fell asleep and um, he woke up and said, Daddy, I had a vision. He said, I, I saw you pick up my tablet in the blanket and throw it in the fire. <laughs> God has a way to speak to the children. But we have to put them in the right atmosphere for God to talk to them. So let's, let's be practical. Let's use this time, as Brother Aaron is saying. Let's, let's not just talk it. Let's really look at our week and say, man, Friday to Saturday, we're going to have to do this. So this is our prayer time. And as I was saying in the last study, you have to keep working at it because there will become different things. You'll agree on six o'clock and then all of a sudden six don't work and then we'll do seven. All of a sudden seven's a problem. You as a leader, as men of God, we have to persevere and work in union with our wives to really have something set in our house. When you look at what the old altar looked like from the Old Testament, it wasn't no flimsy thing, you know, it was a big stone thing. It was things that were cut, that were um, made from, from stones that you couldn't put a hammer on. But you had to fix that thing. It was a big structure. And I, I find in our lives that not only are our altars so weak, but they're not hardly visible. You hear me? We have to create altars that are unmissable. We have to create moments of sacrifice and devotion that as a house, we just can't miss. And so I'm, I'm just endorsing that encouragement that we be very practical and deliberate and look at our calendar, look at our week, look at our work schedule and say, right, this is where we're going we're gonna to put God in and we're not going to give him what's left. We're going to try and give him what's best. We're going to try and give him first. Right. right, And that Deuteronomy scripture, so you speak in my heart. Those are the things that I hold to. To love is the first thing. You can't, you can't look away from the first and great commandment. You can't just gloss over it. You can't rush over it. To love him. Because if you do number one, everything else in, that, in those commandments becomes much easier to do. When you love him the way you should love him, covetousness is not a problem for you. Yeah, right. it's not a problem. But get, let's let's work on getting number one right to love God with everything, and it's my prayer too. And it's one thing that I continue asking the Lord to help. We're here in Bible study, but Bible study is just a place to build up. We must have other programs and projects. But I'm not, I'm not living to teach. That's that's not what I live to do. I live to serve God in many ways. This is just one way. There are still sinners that need to be reached, and we still need to find ways to reach them. There are family members that are not saved yet. We need to pray them through, fast them through. Yeah, we, we can't give up. This is the time to catch our families. So, Brother Heron, you're stirring me up. Mm -hmm. All right. Answer. So, I want us to be aware of this. There are spirits that are, they attach themselves to families. And some people call them generational curses. And while the phrase generational curse is not in the Bible, and I like to really stick to Bible, um, we have to also, though, watch the patterns of what happens in the lives of men of God. And we also should look in our own lives, even look at the people around you, 
and see if these patterns continue and are true. And so one thing I've noticed is that sins of the fathers often repeat themselves in the children. And not only that, but by second or third generation, that sin is almost like it's accelerated and gets even worse. Um, you have a few kings that were able to buck the trend. So you have some kings that had wicked fathers and then the sons were, were good and they tried to stamp it out. And then the next king might come and raise up idolatry and the next son might come and, and try and wipe it out. So it, it, it's not a fixed thing. I'm not saying that, you know, if your daddy was like this, you must be like this. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we need to be aware that this pattern can happen where certain spirits like to attach themselves to families and the things that happen with grandma happen with, with the daughter grandfather son and grandson um these spirits like to attach themselves and it goes back to the point that the things that the father don't overcome becomes a challenge for the children to overcome i looked at abraham we know the story i think most of us here where you know on two occasions he, he lies about sarah being his sister um, rather than his wife. Now, he, he, he did that, one might say, in good conscience and, you know, for reasons that for him were to protect his wife. But nevertheless, he, he made lied. that mistake on two occasions. And, um, you know, thankfully, he avoided the wrath of the king in both of those situations. And in fact, in one place, God had to speak to the Pharaoh and tell him, don't touch this woman. Um, so, Thank God for that. But we see Isaac doing the same thing, um, lying about his wife being his sister. So that was identical. But then Jacob, you know, he's, he's a born trickster. I mean, unfortunately, he got the name of a trickster as well. So he is on a completely next level of supplanting and, and, and being crafty and stealing from his brother. Now, all these things, I still see them as, as being in the will of God. Um, when you look at who Jacob was supposed to be in the prophecies, it can be argued, and I even teach it this way, that if, if, he, if he didn't have the nature of his name, um, then maybe he wouldn't have got what was rightfully his. <laughs> um, so we can still see God working on all of this, but don't miss the trait being passed down. David, we know, also um, married many wives. And we know originally in the law, it wasn't something that they were supposed to do um, nevertheless he had many wives um, Solomon it became a weakness for him he married beyond Israel and it, it was worse than him. you saw also um, David's son Amnon who ends up raping his sister half-sister Tamar 2nd Samuel 13 what we're seeing here is that by the time you get to next generation second or third generation that lust becomes unbridled, okay? And I, I look at this word, unbridled lust, which, you, which is in some translations, you'll see it in um, Ephesians 5, verse 3. And maybe, brother, then if you read that from yours, sometimes it would say whoremonger or fornicator. Just read, read Ephesians 5, 3 and Ephesians 5, 5. Let's hear how it's spoken of in Ephesians. Okay. Um, so if Ephesians 5, 3... Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Okay, so that's the sexual impurity. Go on. For, uh, for obscene God. stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. And this one is talking about the immoral. Yeah. Right? So, so this, this lust becomes unbridled. And if you've ever had to, to work with people who are struggling with lust, it's a, it's a horrible spirit. I always say to, to married folks that beware of lust in your marriage. You're supposed to love your wife not lust your wife. The spirit of lust is, is an undiscriminating spirit. Okay, it's, it, it doesn't care whether it's in the end, when it reaches its, its goal, when it's bringing forth its, its worst fruits, it doesn't care whether it's man, woman, or beast, or child, because it's just lust. It just wants its desire 
to be satisfied. Um, those men, a lot of those men who end up raping people, you'll find when they go into their houses and, and dig up all of their files and whatnot, they were watching so much pornography and they got themselves stoked up to such a degree that they could not control themselves. And so they end up attacking people. This spirit of lust um, in, in David didn't manifest in the same way as it did in Amnon. And so there, there are spirits that, as again I say, if, if we don't deal with them, they don't only get passed on, but they can get worse in the next generation. And so it's so important, the secret things. David prayed this prayer, you know, he, he said, even the hidden things, the secret things, deliver me from the secret faults. And in another place, the presumptuous sin, you know, the thing we think we can get away with, uh, you know, the thing we think that nobody's seeing. And, and David needed to pray that prayer because, you know, he, he was a man that had sinned, but he wasn't repenting straight away. And, we, you know, as much as we have that psalm of repentance, which we love, it was triggered by the prophet Nathan, who by the power of the spirit of God had to call him up and use his sense of justice to tell a, a story that was related to him, to get him to see that he needed to repent. So um, right. we, we, we sometimes have buried things in a way and we have become functional. We become functional in dysfunctional situations. Um, it is, it is not right that we have cut people out of our life. And I wanna say it again, I said it before, but it's not, it's not right sometimes that we say, I'm having nothing more to do with that person. It's not the heart of God. It's not the nature of God. The Bible says as much as is possible and as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. The Bible says mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. You don't want to, you don't want to die in confusion. You don't want to die and, 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 there's, and there's warfare. The man of God must die with peace. That must be a sign that this man really served God. The Bible says he not walk with God until he was not but he left the testimony behind him that he pleased God. And so that must be us. We're the ones, we're on the path of the just. We're like that shining light, right? Gets brighter and brighter. We, the older we get is not the more dim we get. The Bible says even in old age, we're bringing forth fruit. We must be getting brighter and brighter until we go home to glory. Amen. We're not on this path. Oh, well, I'm going downhill. No, the believer's life. I always say this to my group here. I, I want to be old and more powerful than I ever was. And by that, I mean, I want to be able to, to do less and achieve more. That's growth, right? If I needed to right. shout at this stage in my life while I have voice to shout, then when I get to 80 and 90, I want to just wave my hand. <laughs> right. And, and I feel the depth of God's glory. I remember being in a church with this old man. I didn't know I was studying in North Carolina um, as a, as a you know, teenager, my early 20s, actually. And... Um, was visiting some churches out there and I remember seeing this old man and he just seemed to walk with so much grace. I didn't know his backstory. Um, and he would have his trombone and he's playing happily. And the man was just full of joy. And one day they called um, the men around the back for a brother's meeting. And um, it's funny because the pastor couldn't be there, but he was there. And then I just saw the authority with which he spoke to those men and they all respected him. I'm like, who is this guy? Turns out this man used to be the bishop of the church and he was sitting in the congregation as a worshiper because he had given space for the pastor to come up and leave. I was like, number one, what humility. Yeah, this, this man of God was just, it's like he had finished his course and he was just happy to be a worshiper. And I would see him walk down the aisle some days and just like waving his hands this way waving his hands that way and the spirit of God just moving in the house. I'm like, what's going on? Well, this man had finished his course with joy. Right? He wasn't trying to hang on to the pulpit and say, you know, I'm standing here till I'm dead. He, he had a grace about him to see another man rise and do well and to support that man. This is more of the spirit that we need in our churches. And so we have to, you know, we can grow old with grace. We don't want to, we don't want to grow old and go down. We want to grow old and, and and, and, and have more as we get older. Now, the final example here is I want to look at was, was Jehu from 2 Kings chapter 10. Now, you know, we talked about the spirit of Jezebel. She's very much alive, the spirit in our time, the Bible tells us. 
that we need to watch out for her in the time of the end. Uh, we need to watch out for her doctrine and her influence and so on. And so Jehu, for me, was always a bit of a hero because he dealt with the matter, you know. I see, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been reading the Bible from a, from a kid and I didn't feel good about seeing Elijah get, you know, discouraged in that way. <laughs> a nice way, you know, for that story to end for me. And even though Elisha was appointed, I always saw, I always saw that transition to Elisha as, as God saying to Elijah, okay, that's it. I'm done with you. And you might read it differently, but read it again. When, when Elijah starts to moan, God says, go and get Elisha. Let's move on. I'm ready. You're ready to move on. I'm ready to move on. So I never really liked this. And so when I see Jehu come in and dealing with the matter, right, you know, it brought some joy to my heart. As much as it's a, a murderous scene, right? This woman needed to be taken out of the way. But I, there's a warning to, to be taken from Jehu's life. And um, I want you to turn there, Brother Danny, for me. Go to 2 Kings 10. And... We can, yeah, let's have a look at, yeah, verse, verse 27, um, all the way down to verse 29, 27 to 29. Let's read that. 27 to 29. Um, they smashed the sacred pillar and wrecked the temple of Baal converting it into a public toilet as it remains to this day. In this way, Jehu destroyed every trace of Baal worship from Israel. He did not, however, destroy the gold calves at Bethel and Dan, with which Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to sin. Nonetheless, the Lord said to Jehu, you have done well in following my instructions to destroy the family of Ahab. Therefore, your descendants will be kings of Israel down to the fourth generation. Uh, but Jehu did not obey the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. 31. Thank you. So, so he, he didn't turn to the Lord with all his heart. Mm -hmm. And I think of this as you got such a great victory for Israel when you took down Jezebel. And the Lord used you in such a mighty way to do such a big act. But the man didn't finish his course right. Yeah. He still had another battle. And I, it, just, it just made me think that, you know, we have to be careful that when we have had great victories and for those of us who've been in ministry a while, you know, we've got some testimonies. We've seen God heal people. We, you know, we've seen God do wonders. Um, but sometimes we can, we can almost hang on these things as if they are the eternal validation of our Christian walk and, and that God is with us. And whatever God did through yesterday, thank God for it, but it's yesterday. Make sure that today there are still no more idols left. Because most of us remember Jehu for taking down Jezebel, but very few people remember that there was those calves, the same calves that the children of Israel made from the time they crossed the, um, the Red Sea. This, this lingering enemy, this lingering problem that keeps coming back for Israel, we still have to be mindful to win those battles. And sometimes they're not always seen. Sometimes they're not the battles that people know that we have, but we know what they are. We need to make sure that we're taking them to the Lord in prayer because it's, it's, it's one thing for people to remember you for one great victory or whatever it is, but God is watching. He says, I'm going to reward you according to all the deeds that were done in your body. You're being according to, <clears throat> according to your works. All right? So we, we don't want any blemish upon our garment. We don't want idolatry so he says that he, he didn't fully commit he didn't fully give his heart over let's not get caught out let's not rest on yesterday's victories um, and what people think about us the bible spoke of one church that says you know you have a name that you're living but you're dead 
the, 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 name, the word on the street is that you're alive, but you're dead. And we don't want to be that kind of believer. We don't want to be that kind of church. Listen, we can have a good Bible study tonight, feel the presence of God, and then we go up, rise up to play. Go and waste our time. Don't soak in the word. Don't do any more prayer. Go sit in front of the TV. And we just, we undo the goodness. We don't let the word of God sink into our spirit. Let's make sure we win the final battle, saints. And let's make sure that we help to keep each other accountable um, in this good fight of faith. Let's make sure that we finish strong. And I had, I had Psalm 78 in there. Um, Brother Heron is posting some more scriptures in there. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, my Psalm 78 is, is really about, um, where it speaks about, we should make sure that the next generation set their hope in God. We have to raise our children in a way that they learn to trust God. Our children must not just think that we, you know, we are great parents and, you know, we are great providers. They must know that we're leaning upon Christ. You know, we are, we, are, we are able to do this because God has favored us, because God has helped us in times of difficulties. It's not just because we are smart or because some of us have degrees or because we have promotions. On it. It's none of those things. It's just God's favor upon our life. And we have to teach our children um, that it, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not even by their accomplishments. So it's, it's not, education is good, but that's not just the thing that makes you successful in life. It's when you learn to put God first. He will always make a way for you. You will not go hungry when you are a kind person, when you are a giving person. God will always find a way to provide for people who give and who love and who serve others. So let's, let's, let's raise our children to really trust in God. There's a set of people who they will turn to drugs. Our children ought not to do that. They should know that when times get hard, they don't have to steal, but they can know that God will make a way for them. But Heron, you, did you want to make a comment? I saw you post some scriptures. Is there anybody else before I move? I'm not going to hold, up, hold us for much longer. Let me see what you said. Okay. Yes, um, bless the Lord Jesus again, brethren. Um, you know, as you spoke, you know, you talk about, you know, as we you know, as we mature into the dear image of his dear son, Jesus Christ, we recognize that it's a, it's a process. And, you know, I have come to understand and recognize that, you know, surely as the Lord has showed it, show, shown it in his word, it's an it's a individual walk, you know, as much as we are able to fellowship one with another and to encourage one another, but more so every man, you know, must um, know in whom he trusts and every man must be persuaded in the one who had given us uh, the hope of glory. And, uh, you know, um, I myself would have grown up and would have exposed to many things in Christendom and you know I would say that you know the Lord would have you know set his hands upon me in a very unique way wherein that I could grow and become uh, that vessel that he would have me to become and so you know all of us you know if we should really stop long enough and to seek the face of the Lord as to purpose and calling because that is very much important for us to run this race with joy and delight you know um it's it's more than just be being in a race but um we're in the race to win um i don't think anybody run you know those athletes who run in the olympics just run to participate in the race and i think there are a lot of participators um that is what a lot of participate that know you're finding in race they don't really have any purpose neither any objective as to you know what they're about and that's not um the the the, the will of the lord towards us all of us are called to a uh, peculiar and specific purpose mm -hmm. and um you know that is something i would have sought the lord for you know 
upon coming in, upon coming to a certain growth and maturity in his word. And you know, um, David said it because sometime you know I, I would have looked in Christendom and see how many of our senior and elderly brothers and sisters in the faith, you know, who are aged, um, and how as they would aged you know, to look on, to go, to go home and to sleep, you know, um, in Christ Jesus. Um, sometime, you know, um, it, 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 it seems as if, you know, they're just waiting, waiting to just, you know, pass away so that they can go home to meet Jesus Christ. But what I had not seen in, in many of, you know, like the elderly in the assembly, which is not, reflective of the scriptures as I would read it myself and as the Lord would have shown it unto me is where I don't see where many of them joy, joy in old age. And I see where this was one of David's desire because of the love that was wrapped up in David's heart for the Lord, wherein that he, you know, he knew the, the, the power and the greatness of God. Um, and he would have proven God in so many ways, knowing that even in old age, you know, God will cause him to joy. And it's not a matter of, well, he comes to old age and then he does wait until the Lord take you out. But he was of the assurance that the Lord can set upon him at old age in a different measure than when he was but a youth. And I would have prayed those prior to say, because we know we read the scripture, we see we are, Abraham and most of those patriarchs of old, how they were taken out by the Lord while they had good strength remaining in them. Yes. You know, the um, uh, Lord told Moses to gather himself, Aaron to gather himself. And the Bible spoke about how they, they were still, you know, a good strength, you know. So they, they, they never died in a, in, a, in a, a way where it was... Um, you know, poor me, poor, sad. poor me, oh my, a sad way. These men were taken out like with strength because you know they knew it was just a journey and to fulfill their course. And even the apostle Paul, all the men who walk before the Lord, the Lord had not left them in the dark, they walk knowing what it is their purpose was, and God showed them revelation and insight as to you know what would be, maybe not all things, but. They died with faith and in and, and 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 with with joy and you know it wasn't any such thing as what we see happening now and in church you know uh, we don't see where you know even our elderly the joy in the Lord as we know they are to because David spoke about it even so much more in Psalm same to one that I that I did share where he said um, from verse nine cast me not off. In the time of old age, he began to pray the prayer, you know, of um, you know, that which is not yet, yes. as if it were to say, cast me not off in old age, forsake me, not when my strength fail it. And listen, I believe these things because yes. I want, and it's because of the love of God that was in his heart to, to worship God. He, he, he really had an encounter that many uh, probably never had. You know, we're in that he, 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 he had experienced the, the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And um, I yeah, think want, that... I, I want he, Brother Danny to read Psalm 92, just to, to back up what you're saying. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Psalms 92, verse 13. For, that's 13 and 14, right? Yes, yes. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. <laughs> right. King James, King James says this, and I'll go back to Torb. I should have said Torb. It says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He yeah. shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. <laughs> to show that the yes. Lord is upright. And that's what I'm saying, that, you know, I think it all comes down to our love for God where, you know, I mean, the Lord, 
he looks for the man whose heart is toward him and the man who love him and tremble at his word. And, um, you know, in these times, you know, we have to know that, you know, our God is lacking nothing, whether in old age or in your youthful days. Um, mm -hmm. God is well able to cause us to bring forth and to produce. So for my uh, brethren in Christ Jesus, the mothers that are online, um, you know, I encourage you that, you know, don't, um, you know, set your mind on just, you know, coming off the scene, but we ought to know that God has so much in store, even at the time of old age, that you have never yet experienced before, and you ought to seek him for these things. <laughs> so, you know, those are my few words at this time. Thank you, you. And, and thank yes, you for sir. posting the uh, Psalm 78 scripture that I had. I didn't have the verses, but uh, Brother Heron has put verse 5 to 7. I was just speaking about the heritage we leave for our children. And it's, it's good all the way from the top, if you read Psalm 78 from verse 1. But it, it says um, from verse 4 that you know, we will not hide them from their children. And we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. This is the NIV. And his power and wonders he has done. And I'll read from verse 5 in the chat. It says, for he established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Remember, we go back to Deuteronomy 6, because after he gives them that command, he says, now teach them to your children. When right. you rise up, when you sit down, when you're going out, put it as frontlets between the eyes, which is part of the lesson tonight, right. and, and bind it to their hands, right? So, yes. so let the law of God be given to them so much. Church, we, we ought to be talking about God around the dinner table. Right? Yes. And when they're rising up, we need to talk to them about the Lord. We need to call out the word of God. Praise him Amen. in the morning. The Amen. house must be full of praises to God that the children are steeped in this. And, and if I was to come full circle on how, how we really overcome the mark of the beast, this is it. It's loving God. It's yes, loving God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, yeah. with everything that's within you. Loving yeah. him. That's how you overcome the mark of the beast. You right. Keep, right. That's it. Hand, you keep the word in your heart. Um, you keep it right before your eyes. That means you can't miss it wherever you turn in. Yeah, the word of God is right in your forehead. We have to be in the word so much. So yes. Psalms is saying here that you know we're not going to hide it from our children. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. So even those that don't come yet, we are we are supposed to do a work that's so immersive that the generation that comes after this generation have to catch it because we put them so deep in God's word. So even the children which should be born, who should arise, somebody's writing on my screen, Brother Danny, you're experimenting. <laughs> um, that they should, who should arise and declare them to their children. So we should not only be teaching our children, but we should be teaching them to teach their children. As I have done mm -hmm. with you, so do with your children. I, I love hearing the testimonies of like my father's generation and I hear very few of them now. Grandmother used to wake us up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. for prayer. I, I don't, it seems like now those testimonies just belong in the, in the 50s and the 60s and the, and the 70s maybe. But and like, the 90s, my father used to wake us up too. <laughs> right? These, they sound like old, old testimonies and it, it seems like the next generation, they're not waking their kids up for prayer. You know, oh, now we, we're so wise, we shut down church early at night time <laughs> because the children have to go to school. And so we'll get My them up to school, but we won't get them up early for prayer. We, like we've gone backwards. So, Amen. Backwards. so much My Lord. we need to redeem the time. And we have time to do it right now, saints. We can set up new structures in our home in this window and pray that they don't fall back down when things get back to whatever the new normal will be. But it says, look, we're going to declare them, that they should declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. It's important that our children know what God has done so that they will know that there's a reason to obey him. You understand? Sometimes we, we, we give children a religion, but we have not really shown them the works of God the way we should have shown them. Right. The reason we're serving God is look what the Lord did for us. 
Yes. Give them the testimonies. I love my parents' testimonies. I could spend a whole night giving you just my father and mother's testimonies, whether it's the healing from when he was a baby, you know, all the way running up. These things, they anchor me. You know, the first, the first miracle I saw in my ministry was from a story my dad told me and from the things he used to do for me and our family. When we were sick, he would give us water to drink us to drink it in Jesus' name. Well, he sold that into my spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lady in my, my mother's house with a, I didn't know it, but she had a 10-year-old ulcer in her stomach. And she was writhing in pain. I gave her a drink. I said, drink this in Jesus' name. And she vomited up this 10-year-old ulcer. Why did I do that? Because something was in me from a child that was put in there by my father that you can move by faith and get results. Right. You understand? There are people that don't they don't they don't they don't live with that awareness. They don't serve a God of miracles, you know. They serve a God like Allah who just have to, have to make sure you bow down, make sure you obey him. And eventually people can't deal with religion. They must have relationship. They right. must have something Amen. that holds them because oh God, who wants laws? Nobody just wants laws. We need love. <laughs> and God is love. So we have to expose our children to the aspects of God that is going to hold them. It is not good enough. Yes, it's, it's wake them up for prayer, yes. But show them God's love. You know, be God's love to them. Give them a reason to see God in you and working in you. They will grow up and have more than just, I went to church, my parents woke me up. They will, in, somewhere in the middle, they're going to taste and see for themselves that the Lord is good, that the man is blessed to trust him. So we have to bring them to a place of trusting. All right, I, I don't like to go beyond... 9 30 especially when i have a, a natural pause and i think i'm gonna have to give up on <laughs> trying to finish this lesson brother dennis i just see you there i didn't know you were here so good to, good to oh yes you. So you guys are talking I, I i'm just hearing brother um say brother heron because when you touch about the um loving jesus and um you, you touch my subject and i was just getting stirred up that's why i took the mic off a while ago when i heard the brother um and when i'm here to topic about um because it's the message i ministered i was ministering for pastor jared yesterday and it was the scripture yesterday with that i heard you read sir hero israel the lord thy god is one and then he said now i know now I've, now you all know i'm one now enter a relationship with me i'm gone back on this relation thing relationship thing and I'm seeing how I was encouraging people yesterday, the 30 people online that, you know, let us understand we are called into relationship. Mm -hmm. We are called to serve him. We are called to love him. And mm -hmm. when we feel that we have not loved him, he said, thou shalt do it with all our heart. Okay, we might not be there, but Lord caused me to get there. Yes. When God see that we are making the effort. Oh, come on now, brother Aaron. When Go ahead, God, when God see us making the effort, Paul right. said, "Not that, not that I have, al I have already apprehended. I'm not there yet, but guess what? I am pressing. I'm going beyond how I feel. Because if right. you're addicted, wait for feeling. Feeling will, you will never pray. You will never yes. strive and hunger and thirst for God." Right. But Paul said, you know yeah. what? I am pressing towards it. I, I, I'm, Lord, help me to get there. And Lord, I'm not there yet, but teach me how to love Amen. you with that love that you told me I must love you with all. Oh, God. That love, Lord. And then, and because you remember the devil is seeking every single day. To, the Bible said he seeks to have you. Mm -hmm. And that he may sieve you. In other words, drain out anything that you should yes. have for Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to empty you out. And I'm going to create an assault against the church. You people that are online right now. The devil doesn't like this. He doesn't like Brother Reed uh, okay. and, and, and Pastor Joseph setting up this, this, this platform here. And I'm going to be determined. But I, I, I want a set of people that will love me. And when you feel that, job, that, that love draining out, you say, Lord, tap me up back again. Stir me up again. Somebody said, upon my bed, I sought for the one who my soul loves. <laughs> I sought him. I was in my comfort zone. And sometimes we have to come out of comfort zone. Oh, somebody, we got to come yes. out of the comfort zone Amen. just to find who the soul loves. 
And the Bible said, I walked past the watchman and scarcely said, have you seen who my soul love? And, he's, and scarcely as I passed, I found him. And when I found him, he said, I would not let him go. Are you coming home back to my mother's house? And he said, he put him and he said, come on, you people around me. Don't wake him up. Don't wake up my love. Don't stir him up. Oh, praise mm. God. Amen. And as I was in conversation oh, with Pastor Mullins on the phone the other day, it's the same thing. We were talking about the love and where Pastor Mullins was and where I am in Kent. The power of God came down on both of us on the phone, just talking about the love, loving oh. him, loving him. We are called into relationship. And thou right. shalt love him with all. God bless you. I won't continue. That's just Hallelujah. And Amen. that's how we, that's how we overcome. Amen, brother. Amen. That's how we overcome. And with the love of yes, God. Sir. Amen. And um, th that love will, will manifest in the things we do. It will manifest in the way we think. And we worship. In, in the things we say. And what we give our time to in worship. Okay. Yes. So it's, sometimes, sometimes, saints, we, we, we have overcomplicated some really simple things about the scriptures mm -hmm. and what one of the things that we wanted to drive home with this study is is that with the with the mark of the beast it really is a heart that loves god ah. deuteronomy 6 it's having your hands clean it's having your heart loving god your hands clean and your mind set on the word of god and so if we find ourselves falling out of love that that is the problem um, the Bible speaks about the falling away. That's the problem. It speaks about because iniquity abounds. That's the problem. The love of many waxing cold. That's the problem. Um, the church in the last days, the dosia, is lukewarm. That's the problem. It's, it's, it's not hot for God. And so we, we're not going to overcome by outsmarting the devil with currency. We're not going to overcome <laughs> by avoiding a chip. Right? right, love of God in you. Yes. Right. The Bible, that is gonna cause you. the Bible says this, and and I will close with this. It says, you know, everything that is born of God, he that is born of God, it. overcomes the world. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you Perfect overcome the love? You need a Cross spiritual. Out all fear. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. Right. All it's, fear. It's the new birth. It's the birth so. of the spirit. It's the life of the Holy Spirit in you. That causes you to overcome the world. My father would have put it this way. He says, if your joy is born of God, your joy will overcome the world. No. If your love is born of God, your love will overcome the world. All right. If your peace is from God, your peace will overcome. So we as the children of God, let's, let's not follow any of the enemy's distractions in, in this time. Let's use the time and space that God has given us to draw even closer and closer to him. There is a spirit out there, and I guess the final spirit, this spirit of Shemosh is God, which is looking to subdue, and that means to bow. And, and there are systems that want us to bow in this last time. Yes. They're coming through education, they're coming through business, they're coming through politics. What I'm finding is, is that wherever you go, like, the, like Daniel and those Hebrew men, if you stand on what you believe and keep loving God, you'll be all right you'll be able to survive this system because you become right. untouchable. You are unblameable. And even when they work with the wickedness against you, the effect that it has on you is not the same effect that it has on other people because that fire would have burned up anybody else and those lions would have yammed anybody else. But when <laughs> we are put in those situations, God is saying, listen, in the fire, I'm with you. In the flood, right. I'm with you. Just make sure that you have this friend before you need him. Make sure that we're in relationship before it's tested. Because it's going to be tested. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Don't be surprised. The church is going to shake. Everything is going to shake. And the only thing that's going to be left standing is the thing that God himself has built. Right. Amen. So on Christ, the solid rock, we stand the right. I said, all other ground is stinking sand. It's the time for us, church, uh, to, to build upon the rock. This rock is Jesus. This truth is Jesus. Uh, the wise man, he says, he, he, he built his house upon the rock. The foolish man was on the sand. Some would say, but the beach is nice. <laughs> the beach is, 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 is got good weather.
a nice attraction. The church must build not upon what is appealing to men, what not upon what is good for a season. We need to be built upon the rock. Christ said to Peter, finally, upon this rock, I build my church. What was that? That was the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Well, upon this rock, I built my church in the gates of hell. Shall not prevail against it. I want to thank everyone for being on tonight. The rest of my teaching is really simple. It's just showing you all the way through the scriptures where we need to have our minds set upon God, showing you the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. Um, you can look at those if you want. We send that out. But it's just to emphasize this is not new. The idea that our minds um, need to be renewed, need to be spiritual, need to be set on God, need to not be like the old mind. It's not a new concept. Mm. It's very much applies to the mark of the beast. It's thinking like God. And then we look at the hands and I've shown you here hands throughout scripture, um, what it means, um, how hands are, are lifted to God, how hands can transfer sin, how hands are supposed to be washed and clean. Right? It's, it's all there in the scriptures. And so this is, it's not, it's not complex. It's just to show you that the Bible is very clear that when he speaks about hands, um, it's, he's really speaking about the deeds um, Iniquity in, in Psalm 77 verse 3 Is in the hands But in, in Psalm 18 he says He's teaching my hands to war And he's teaching my fingers to fight Okay, um, And these all have spiritual meaning When we compare spiritual things with spiritual And finally he says Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord In Psalm 24 verse 4 it's he that has clean hands and he that has a pure heart. When God's speaking about clean hands, he's not speaking about hands without chips in them. He's speaking about hands that have practiced good things, hands that have not been, um, been involved in, in stealing, not been involved in a false balance, not been involved in iniquity. Your hands are clean because you've not put them to do evil. Daniel was in Babylon and was able to come out with clean hands. He's working for the king and still able to come out with clean hands. This is what this, this word is really all about. So let's continue to keep loving God. My final slide was here just to give us something to rejoice about in Revelation, concluding that um, even though there was war in heaven, even though, you know, Satan was fighting, the Lord says in verse 10, I, I heard a, a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him. Church, I love it. The Lord speaks about this in past tense. All right. We overcome the devil. It, we overcome him so much so that God is already speaking about it as being in the past. He's already defeated. We Good. overcame him by the blood of the lamb, that salvation that we couldn't pay for. By the word of our testimony, and I believe that's not just our testimony, but that we hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ, that we have the spirit of prophecy at work in us. That's another teaching. But it says, and they love not their lives unto the death. So we're in this world, but we don't love it so much that we allow it to kill us. We don't mm -hmm. hold on to all of its accoutrements that we can't let anything go for God. We don't get to a point where, like Lot, this world is so dear to us. That even though we're in the church, our heart is still in the world. You won't make it in that way. Ooh. We love not our lives to the death. The Lord says, if you love your life, Shall lose it. you're going to lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, Shall find it. you'll find it. Let me lose myself, the writer said. Or maybe, Dennis, you can close with that one. And I'll find it, Lord, in thee. <laughs> or self be slain, my friend see only thee. And though it cause me grief and pain, I'll find my life again. Let me lose myself. I'll find it, Lord, in thee. Bless you all for coming on tonight. Though it cause me grief and pain. <laughs> Our brother Dennis is just going to sing the song as we close. And thank you, everyone. Mother Reed, it's great to have you on tonight. Thank you for coming. Let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. Let us self be slain, my friend, see only thee. 
Though it costs me grief and pain, I shall find my life again. If I lose myself, I'll find it, Lord, in thee. Let 